Good morning. Very warm welcome to you to our online service this morning, 27th of June, 2021. My name's Greg Cushing, and as ever, it's a great honour and privilege to welcome you to our online service. I'm in uh, Loxwood Church Building, the vicar of the parish of Ulfold and Loxwood. This is St John the Baptist, Loxwood, and uh, we will be having a service here on the grounds, hopefully outside of the weather holds this morning at 10 a.m., although when it's been uh, rainy, which hasn't actually been all that often, we've come uh, inside um, in a COVID safe way. Um, we just passed, didn't we, this last week, the 21st of June. You know what that means? It means that the days are now getting shorter. Which is, which is sad for most of us. Maybe you're happy if you're a parent, if you've got young ones, they stay away later when it's lighter, so you're thinking, yeah. Anyway, we've passed that part of the year. Um, amazing, it's gone so quickly, hasn't it, these COVID times. We're Brits, very easily start talking about weather, but we're here to uh, come together. You've clicked onto this YouTube channel to worship God. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to begin with a prayer. It is the fourth Sunday after Trinity. And I'm going to put the, the collect up on the screen as we begin now. And then after that, we'll be uh, listening to a wonderful song, My Lighthouse. Jesus is the one who shines light in our darkness and guides us to safety. Uh, before we carry on with our series in Ephesians. So let's just take a moment now. Quiet and your yourselves, that internal dialogue which is going at the start of a new day. Quieten your souls. Ask God to come in. And let's pray together. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy that with you is our ruler and guide. We may so pass through things temporal that we lose not our hold on things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Ephesians 3 verses 14 to 21, a prayer for the Ephesians. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Shall we pray? Father God, please speak to us now by your spirit. Mould us and shape us that we would be greater prayers. Teach us how to pray. Amen. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? We often ask that question to children, don't we? And it's a bit of fun, really, because we know that whatever comes out of the child's mouth will likely be impossible. I'd like to be able to fly like Superman. That's lovely, dear. Well, you could become a pilot. (laughs) I'd like to be able to see through walls. Well, son... We do have doors for a reason, but maybe you're going to be an optometrist and and help people improve their vision. Don't we tend to, to limit what's possible? We do it all the time with our perceived understanding of reality. But what if much, much more was possible than we ever even imagined possible? Some of you will have heard of the ontological argument for God's existence hundreds of years ago. St Anselm said that God is that being greater than what we can conceive, what we can think up and imagine. And therefore, in our imaginations, just say that we think of God as as being the most powerful and loving God that we can possibly imagine. Well then, God's going to have to be even greater than what exists simply in our minds. And more than that, that this even greater God must therefore exist in reality. For if he only existed in the mind, then an even greater being will always exist in reality, fueling the limitations of what these things up here, our imaginations, are capable of. It's a bit of a mind bender, I know. But what I'm trying to say is that God is great. He is powerful. Far more so than our minds can ever fathom. Today we're thinking about prayer. And Paul's prayer in our passage is bracketed by two truths about God. It's sandwiched by them which I think if we understand, will unblock the floodgates of our prayers. So, sandwiching Paul's prayer, we have firstly verse 14. Just have a look at that for a quick second. For this reason, he writes, i.e. because of everything mentioned in in chapter 2, namely the scandalous grace of Jesus, that he should give us life through his death when we trust him, even though we're the guilty ones and he's the innocent one. For this reason, I kneel. I mean, that's amazing as well. People stand when they prayed, stood when they um, prayed uh, back then. But Paul simply just has to kneel because he's just so in awe of God and and kneeling provides that that kind of um, sense of awe and reverence and humility. Anyway, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. The first bracket is that 
God is the life giver and family sustainer. And the emphasis here is, is not necessarily on every family we can think of in our neighborhood, but more specifically on God's family, both those living and those who've already died on earth. And he holds his family together, even though momentarily we are separated through that schism of death. So that's verse 14. Then comes Paul's prayer, and then we come to the second bracket, the other side of the sandwich, if you like, which we simply have to read again. Verses 20 to 21, amazing verses. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Now the emphasis here ties back in, if you like, with that ontological argument I just mentioned. God is greater than we can ever fully uh, fathom. Much greater. He can do more than we can ever dream or imagine. Now friends, that's the two brackets, the two um, sandwich ends of, of Paul's prayer here. And I want to say to you right now that if you knew and I knew at all times that these brackets were true, why would we not pray like Paul here? Surely if we know God can do more than we think possible in us and through us, we won't be embarrassed to pray those prayers our friends might laugh off, will we? You cannot pray a prayer that exceeds God's power. And you cannot even think a thought beyond God of what God can do. Why would we not pray like this when we know that even Jesus himself is praying for us? Hebrews 7 verse 25 tells us, Consequently, he, Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercessions for them. So friends, today we're thinking about prayer. We are looking at one of the most amazing prayers. A prayer prayed for us as the readers of Paul's letter. And uh, from this prayer, very briefly, I hope to share four things. You can pray for, for our church, this church, the parish of Allfold and Locksford, any church any Christian that you know. Four things. First thing to pray, verses 16 and 17. Pray for a spirit-strengthened inner being. Pray for a spirit-strengthened inner being. Uh, verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul regularly prayed for power. He wasn't afraid to ask for it. He's actually already prayed for power for his readers back in chapter 1, verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches, his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Not afraid to pay, pray for power. And friends, we, we've got to be honest. We are bombarded, aren't we? A zillion different ways, a zillion different forms of temptations every day. We need power to say no and respond in a way which honours God. Uh, dead fish, they float downstream, don't they? Just happens. They go with the flow. It takes great power and energy for a salmon to swim upstream, climbing a waterfall. A great picture of a Christian trying to live in a world which doesn't always honour Christ's standards. But there's something else here very striking about this first prayer. And that's that Paul places the spiritual before the physical. Uh, those of you reading uh, deep theological tomes, don't mishear me. I'm not suggesting that Paul was into dualistic thinking in any way, not at all. 
I'm simply stating that here Paul is praying for power in our inner being, the spiritual, immaterial realm. Now, it's clear to see what Paul means by the inner being here. I mean, you only have to um, hold this passage alongside 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, to see what he um, writes there. He, he contrasts the inner being, that same word he uses in the Greek, with the outer being. The outer being being that which is temporal, temporal wasting away our aging bodies, if you like, our outer shell. In other words, the spiritual compared with the physical. Now, I stress this because if you're anything like me, and I'm sure you are in this respect, I think we spend too much time praying for the physical. Oh, Father, I pray for, for safety. Father, I pray that I'd, I'd get rid of this cold. Father, place your healing hands on dot 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 now don't get me wrong there's absolutely nothing wrong with those prayers nothing wrong they're good prayers the challenge for us is priorities and emphasis i'm sure there would have been just as many sick children in the ephesian church back then as there are today and yet paul doesn't pray for their physical needs he knew that having a strong inner being it's far more significant than having a fine outer shell. We perhaps can all think of folk who spent most of their lives focused on the outer shell and who sadly in old age, despite a really healthy mind and a really healthy body, grew more and more bitter and grumpy, pushing family away, showing no interest in grandchildren. And, you know, the saddest thing for me is taking the funerals of folk like that, when I don't even meet a, a friend or a family member who wants to say a kind word about them, just an executor. And it's very businesslike. And I say, oh, how sad. But then I'm sure if you're a Christian here, you can probably think of some older saints Maybe even in our congregation, maybe in another congregation you've been a part of. Saints in your life whom you hope to emulate in some way. Sure, outwardly, their bodies may be wasting away, but they live as though they already have one foot in heaven and they excite and enthuse every Christian they come into contact with. You can be sure they prayed about their inner self. So that's uh, our first uh, little prayer topic from this great prayer of Paul's. Pray for a spirit-strengthened inner being. Secondly, pray for a rootedness in God's love. Verse 17, pray for a rootedness in God's love. Very briefly, just have a look at verse 17 again. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love. Now, remember Paul's in prison. If you were listening to any other prison, prisoner pray, I wonder what you'd expect to hear. Perhaps you would hear prayers for their families, that they wouldn't bear the burden of embarrassment of the husband or the son's conviction. Or maybe if it were us in prison, we'd hear prayers for our daughter's safety, or perhaps prayers for our own strength, because prisons can be tough places, can't they? I mean, for any who've faced time, you know that. And so rather than praying for nice things, you might pray for you know, that, that power to be physically strong to put up with the bullies. For any who've watched the recent three-part series on BBC titled Time, clear to say prisons are very, very tough, hard places. Perhaps here we wouldn't expect a prayer for greater love. <laughs> and yet that is precisely what Paul prays for his readers. And presumably it's what he was therefore praying for himself to, that he'd be more loving, even in prison. It would be easy, wouldn't it, for a prisoner to despise his guard, always locking him up, always 
throwing him in darkness. Be easy to bear a grudge. But for Paul, no. Instead, love. It would be easy for us to hold grudges against those who oppose the church, who put up barriers for us, I don't know, running things like holiday clubs or, or put up barriers to running Christian assemblies or, or put up barriers to saying grace at family mealtimes. But no, instead, we're to love. Paul's metaphors here, just think about them. Love is to be the soil in which our life is rooted and also the foundation on which our life is built. In the words of John Lennon, all you need is love. For friends, love has a name and his name is Jesus. So secondly, pray for a rootedness in God's love. Thirdly, pray for an experiential knowledge of Christ's love. Verses 18 to 19. Pray for an experiential knowledge of Christ's love. Let's read those verses. Wonderful verses. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Now we're still on the topic of love with this third kind of prayer pointer. But these verses aren't actually about us as us loving Christ even more. No, that was verse 17, our last point. Now in verses 18 and 19, the emphasis is that we might better grasp Christ's love for us which will undoubtedly also lead to us loving him more. It's just the natural response. <laughs> How do you measure love? How do you measure love? Do you measure it in, in hugs, in buckets, in words? We can understand, can't we, why Paul used four dimensions, wide, long, high, deep. Hang on, we say, I thought there were only three, you know, 3D, three dimensions. <laughs> Paul's having a bit of fun here, isn't he? Because he knows that Christ's love is beyond measure. But he's praying that we might know just a little bit more of it each day because we'll never, ever exhaust it. Now, I had forgotten this until uh, rereading it last week. I've mentioned before in our um, church family the name R.A. Torrey, one of my hero evangelists from, you know, 100 years ago. It said that one day, whilst earnestly seeking God's face, reading the Bible, he was so overwhelmed by a profound consciousness of God's love that he just began to weep and weep and weep. So much so that he had to ask God to stop, to show him no more. He could not bear it. What a story. You see, when we're talking about knowledge here we're not just talking about the intellectual head knowledge we're talking about an experiential heart knowledge i think i've said this before too there's stuff that i know that i know there's also stuff that i know that i don't know but then there must be loads of stuff that i don't know that i don't know now friends that is true of knowledge but it's also true of christ's love it's fathomless. Taste and see, we read in the scriptures. Taste is a sense, it's experiential, not merely intellectual, as intellectually satisfying as Christianity is. Or maybe Psalm 73, as you know, one of my favourite passages in all of scripture. Whom have I in heaven but you, and on earth there is nothing I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God, you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I've known something of how the psalmist feels here. He's just exhausted, empty, you know, feeling like I can't go on. And yet in that moment, carried, lifted, loved, sustained. Uh, John Stott says of these four dimensions of Christ's love that it's broad enough 
to encompass all mankind, especially Jews and Gentiles, the theme of these chapters, long enough to last for eternity, deep enough to reach to the most degraded sinner and high enough to exalt him to heaven. And there's a great story of an altar call being offered at the end of a sermon at a large evangelistic service. First person to walk down the aisle and kneel up the front, repentant, was a well-known prostitute. Everybody had seen her hanging around on street corners. The news of Jesus there and then changed her life. She was genuinely repentant and asking God to forgive her. And all the churches, uh, the churchgoers in there were thinking, yes, praise God, hallelujah, this is great. But then all of a sudden, she stands up and she expresses to everybody there that she's done with her old way of life now. She's done with that. And there and then she wants to become a member of this church. And as she says those words, jaws, they drop open and there's silence. More silence. The silence was deafening. Outraged by the lack of welcome, one of the members got up and sarcastically said, I guess we all blundered when we prayed that the Lord would save sinners. We forgot to specify what kind of sinners. We better ask him to forgive us this oversight. Yes, the Holy Spirit has, has saved this woman, but the Lord apparently doesn't understand that she's not the type we want him to rescue. We'd better spell it out for him just what sinners we had in mind. <laughs> Now immediately their hypocrisy was realised and the new Christian was accepted as a new church member. Christ loves to forgive. That's his love. Whoever. If we're repentant, he loves to forgive us. Come to him. So we can know Christ's love intellectually, we can feel it experientially and we can also see it demonstrably at the cross. Ancient commentators saw Paul's four dimensions here in the shape of the cross. So the wooden uh, upright reached down into earth and pointed up to heaven, while the cross beam pinning the arms of Christ stretched open wide to welcome the whole world. Friends, today if you want to know that you're loved, look at the cross of Jesus. You're loved with an everlasting life. As Jesus himself said shortly before his crucifixion, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for you. Well, before we move on to the final thing to pray for our church, your friends, don't miss the words together with all the Lord's holy people in verse 18. You know, I, I hear so many saying to me today, especially after enjoying online church services around the world during COVID, it's easy to just click onto any church service, isn't it, around the world? You know, they say to me, Greg, I'm happy simply being a Christian at home. I can listen to sermons, great sermons from the world's finest preachers whenever I want. I can listen to great worship songs whenever I want. True. But sadly, the greatest experience in life, that, that inner knowledge of Christ's love, it's going to be limited for those who say that when it doesn't have to be. You see, it needs the full family of God to understand the full love of God. Friends, your parish church, this fellowship, is much more crucial for you than maybe we realise for our sense of well-being than maybe we realise. Thirdly then, pray for an experiential knowledge of Christ's love. Fourthly and finally, pray for an overflowing of God. An overflowing of God. Verse 19, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Earlier on in our passage, Paul prayed that Christ would dwell in our hearts and the onus there was on the fullness of Christ dwelling within us, just like the fullness of the Godhead inhabits Christ himself. Well, that's the emphasis again here. Be a vessel 
filled with God. Now think about yourself as a vessel, a, a little cup, maybe. And now think about being filled with God. I mean, just think of a little cup. He's, he's more than we can hold in that cup, obviously, isn't he? Going back to the ontological argument, you know, he's greater than our grandest thought. So, you know, even trying to picture fitting the whole of the Pacific Ocean in this tiny little cup doesn't come close to the magnitude of being filled by God. The point, friends, is that if we're praying this for ourselves and our church or our friends, then we're going to be constantly overflowing with God, offering his love to others, speaking his words of comfort to others, transmitting his aroma. Now, like me, I'm sure you are saying, you know, I wish I was more like that. Well, the good news is that when we ask Jesus into our lives, whenever you did that, maybe it was a long time ago, maybe you're going to do it today, but whenever you do that, by his Holy Spirit, he does come to dwell within. It's just that we don't always then give him the freedom he deserves. Think about it. What do we mean when we say to somebody visiting our home, oh, oh make yourself at home, make yourself at home. What do we mean? Do we really mean putting your feet up on our brand new coffee table with your dirty shoes on? Do we really mean devouring everything in the fridge? You know, when I pop out for a few moments, I come back, that special Rolo yogurt that I've got for my pudding that evening is gone. Did I mean that? Do we really mean drilling a hole in the wall to put up a big picture of Mr. Bean because that's what they had in their own home? No, I didn't mean any of that. I just meant you be comfortable, but not too comfortable. Don't take over, just, 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 just behave, take care. Don't change anything. Friends, that is all too often what we do with Jesus. He, he comes to live within us by his spirit, but we just limit him. But when we give him free reign, which is the prayer here, our lives change. They begin to overflow. Isn't it true that when people take up a residence somewhere, their presence eventually characterises that dwelling? Well, let that be true of Jesus in you. So friends, that is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. What an amazing prayer. We're going to spend a few moments in prayer now as we draw to a close. And I want each of us to pray this prayer of Paul's for our church, the parish of Allfold and Loxwood, or maybe another church for you, or maybe it's a Christian we know on our hearts. I want to show you how very briefly. It's dead simple. I'm going to pray together. I'm going to, I'm going to pray for my brother Jason. Let me show you how you do it. So I've got that passage in front of me. I pray that out of Jesus' glorious riches, he may strengthen Jason with power through his spirit in Jason's inner being so that Christ may dwell in his heart through faith. And I pray that Jason, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love which surpasses knowledge that Jason may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Mothers, fathers listening, what if you prayed this prayer for your children every day? What an awesome prayer to pray. That, friends, is how simple it is to use the powerful words of Scripture in our prayers. Why don't you do that for a few moments now? Amen. As we come together in corporate prayer this morning, let each of us in our own hearts echo the words of David from Psalm 5. Listen to my words, Lord, consider my lament. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. Father, first help us to pray for our mission partners this morning. We thank you for Paul and Hawanatu, who often join us on our Zoom Sunday prayer meeting, which helps us to pray for them more personally.
We thank you for their infectious enthusiasm to share the good news with such love and compassion to the Muslims in the Gambia. Please protect them from persecution and give them favour in the eyes of all those they meet. We thank you for the effective witness of Theophany School and we commit their building project to you. We ask that the many children who hear about Jesus would grow strong in faith and obedience. We also pray for those that Paul cares for and those he draws alongside. We lift before you Jacob and ask that you would meet him in his troubles. Closer to home, Lord, we pray for the charity Christians in Poverty, which we support, and help us to be generous in our partnership with them, both in prayer and financially. Many need your help, especially as social deprivation in the UK has been hit so hard during the COVID pandemic. For those struggling with debt and unemployment, we ask that you would give them hope and protect them from the harm of stress, despair and emotional discouragement. We ask for wisdom for those who work at CAP, who provide help to those caught up in the chains of poverty to get their lives back on track. We pray that the courses they run would be effective. Father, we ask for your help. Hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, help us to pray for the church, your church, and particular the Church of England in this land. We thank you for the leadership of Justin Welby and for the many years he has served us during difficult times. We commit him to your loving care during this time of his sabbatical. Refresh him, Lord, we pray. May he combine a time of rest with a time of deeper personal study and reflection. Equip him, Lord, for the tasks ahead, especially his up-and-coming visit around the UK, and also the continuing consultation process around living love and faith. We pray for the Church of England, that the different factions would unite around the Gospel, that you would bring a new depth of compassion, understanding and commitment to live out the heart of the gospel message, remaining faithful to the scriptures. Jesus, we ask for your help. Hear our prayer. Finally, Holy Spirit, we thank you for each one of us in the parish of Alford and Loxwood. Please help us to consider how we can remain faithful to the great commission that you've given us in Matthew 28, to share the gospel with others, our friends and our families. Help us to look outward rather than inward, because we have a sure hope of salvation for those who do not yet know you. We indeed ask your help for those five people on our hearts and give us boldness to invite them to hear the good news. We pray that our lives would be distinctive so that others will see the difference that you make to our goals, perspective and the confidence that we have when we struggle. But not only that, we pray that we would take the opportunities in conversation to speak about Jesus with real empathy and heartfelt concern for others' eternal destiny. Thank you for the Life Explored course running currently and for the new people who've joined in who don't belong to our parish. Thank you for their willingness to share their questions and the truths that they are learning. Lord, we pray that they would come to know you better. Holy Spirit, we ask for your help. Accept these prayers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. No greater hope in life than this Where death had slain, he lies no more No greater peace, for I am His He'll lead me where He's gone before Hallelujah Praise the risen Lord Hallelujah I am His Sting of death great 
better hope in life than this. No greater hope in life than this. My sin is paid, my guilt is gone. His sacrifice, my confidence. His risen life, my victory song. Hallelujah, praise the risen Lord. Hallelujah, I am His. Sting of death removed forevermore. No greater hope in life than First fruits of a multitude His risen life, a gracious gift And all who come will be renewed Hallelujah to hope in life than this a hope no sorrow can remove for Jesus lives and I am his and none can take me from his love hallelujah Praise the risen Lord, hallelujah, I am His, sting of death removed forevermore, no greater hope in life than this, no greater hope in life than this. Well, what a beautiful song that is by Joyful Noise, a um, great group that started uh, during COVID times. Uh, in the service, in the sermon, we've been thinking all about the love of Christ, just how vast it is in Paul's prayer. And that song reminds us that even death cannot separate us from his love. It's amazing. Well, Friends, I hope that this service has blessed you. We're drawing to a close now. Uh, if it has and you'd like to give towards uh, the ministry of our church, then we unashamedly accept any donations folk are willing to give, although it's not an obligation. If you'd like to give to us, we simply want to make Jesus known. We want to bless others. That's what we're about. Then you'll see on your screens a PayPal barcode. Um, Apparently, if you just scan that, you can, you can give to us the church. So there's that option for you if you'd like to. Very many thanks if that is you. Um, if you've got needs and you're in our parish, whatever they are, please be in contact. We would love to help you out in some way. And then finally, I, I want to say, please do be praying for our incoming curate, James Hansen, because he gets ordained um, a week today, next Sunday. So... 4th of July, think about that. Um, be praying for him and the other uh, ordinance just about to be ordained deacons in this diocese. Well, with that topic of prayer, I'm going to say a closing prayer before I bid you farewell. Eternal God and Father, by whose 
power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed. Guide and strengthen us by your spirit that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. God bless and have a great day.